Well, hi everyone. My name is Roberto Castillo. <clears throat> I will introduce myself a little bit more throughout this lecture. But today I'm going to be talking to you about a method, and this method is called ethnography. So the title of this presentation is How to do ethnographic analysis, and this is a very personal <clears throat> approach to research. Um, I know I'm talking to you that come from so many different fields in uh, the social sciences <clears throat> and in the humanities. So we all sort of um, are acquainted with certain types or certain, certain ways of doing things. So today I will introduce you to uh, one specific way in which we do research in social sciences and in humanities. But first, I'm going to introduce myself. That's me, Roberto Castillo. I'm a PhD in cultural studies. You may have seen me around campus. Um, um, I have a background in uh, cultural studies, and, and, and I don't want to talk today very much about cultural studies, but if I needed to describe uh, what is cultural studies is a mixture of sociology, anthropology, and critical theory, although uh, many of my colleagues in the cultural studies department perhaps would disagree with this characterization of the discipline. But for those of you who are not interested in cultural studies or who, ne who will never be getting in touch with cultural studies, uh, I think that's a very good description. I also have a background in political science, uh, history, and journalism uh, and international relations. And for the last um, 13 years now, I've been living in um, in Asia, uh, in the China, in what I call the Chinese world, uh, between Beijing and Hong Kong. I speak uh, Mandarin, French, English, and uh, I'm originally from Mexico, so I obviously speak Mexican Spanish, as you may, may be able to to feel or to hear in my in my accent. Uh, I always uh, apologize because I don't speak Cantonese after so many years of living in Hong Kong. But today we were going to be we're going to be talking about methods in um, uh, in the social sciences and in, in the humanities. And, um, you know, when I came to um, cultural studies, uh, I realized that for a long, long time, people in cultural studies have been talking about methods. Uh, cultural studies is an academic field. And, and don't be scared, I'm not going to talk very much about cultural studies again. Um, cultural studies is an academic field defined by its theoretical and substantive area of interest. Uh, what we look at is in, some, in so many ways the power relations and institutions of modernity, colonialism, and post-colonialism. But the field of cultural studies is not really defined by its methodology, right? So when I came to cultural studies, I realized that I needed to establish my own eclectic methodology. And indeed, cultural studies methodologies have tended to be eclectic, and some people see this as a weakness, and some people see this as a strength, right? Uh, a lot of people that, um, that when you talk to them and you tell them that you work in a field where there's not one single specific method, uh, they definitely think that, you know, what are you doing, right? But again, that's not a weakness. I now see that more as a strength, um, in many ways, one of the strengths or advantages is that when you don't have one specific method that defines your discipline, you can start drawing from a variety of methods across the social sciences and humanities and bring into play, uh, you know, your own experience, uh, sort of mixing or threading your experience with the methods that you are um, uh, using. So in particular, in terms of the method that we use or the method that I'm going to be discussing today, which is ethnography and how we use it in cultural studies, <coughs> we have a high degree of, um, sorry, the um, ethnography allows you to have a high degree of reflexivity and to position your subjectivity within your own uh, research and to have a very interesting interplay between empirical research and theory. So the type of research that I do is qualitative research, and ethnography is perhaps one of the most important methods when we're talking about qualitative research. <clears throat> now, talking about research, there's many ways of appro approaching research. I told you today we're going to have a personal approach to research. So in my own particular experience, which is what I want to convey to you today, 
uh, personal points of departure and personal points of entrance are very important for how your research process evolves. So as I was telling you earlier, for the last 12 or 13 years, I've been living in Asia. And in the first four years, I was living in Beijing. So it is because I've been living in Asia and because I was living in Beijing that now I, I'm doing the type of research that I'm doing. So in many ways, it was not necessarily just one decision that I took one day to engage in a particular topic, but rather it was many um, elements in my own personal story that led me to uh, to this particular point. And perhaps the most important point of entrance or departure, you know, the access point to my, to my particular research came one day many years ago when I was living in Beijing. And when I was living in Beijing, I would normally travel back and forth between Beijing and Hong Kong to do what we call a visa run. Maybe some of you, especially uh, the foreigners, may be familiar with these types of situations. Uh, so in one of these visa run trips, uh, I met a man uh, from Sierra Leone. His name was Myers. I mean, I met Myers in um, on the train station, you know, on the train deck just before boarding the train from Hong Kong to to um, to Beijing. Long story short, um, I I discovered that this guy was coming to China to try to uh, you know look for some kind of personal. Uh, fortune to try to make it in China and uh, I was really surprised by the fact that he told me that there were many Africans coming uh, to China I'm talking about 2008 or a little bit before 2008 so I was really surprised by that and that was really something that influenced my uh, you know gave me a very early idea about a very interesting topic a very interesting social and cultural transformation that at that point I didn't know but later some years later, I would uh, consider uh, making this idea, advancing this idea and sort of developing a research proposal for a PhD. Now, the second point of entrance to this research is obviously all the years that I've been living in China and the fact that I was working uh, for a Chinese, um, Chinese news, um, not the best experience of my life, but I was working in a Chinese news uh, uh, online website uh, for a couple of years, which is related to Xinhua News Agency. And uh, when I was working there, at some point, uh, kind of an editor journalist, I needed to cover a story in which there were some somewhere around 300 to 500 Nigerians, mainly demonstrating against Chinese police in the city of Guangzhou. So when I uh, when it was one morning when I needed to do the uh, the translation of this particular news for uh, international consumption, I was really struck by. Um, by the fact that there were so many Nigerians in Guangzhou. And then somehow I uh, connected that to Myers' story, the guy that I met here in Hong Kong in one of those trips. So I started developing an interest on uh, about foreigners in China and about the types of transformations that were taking place in the country. So a couple of years later, I started sort of defining the topic a little bit more, maybe around 2009 or 2010. I was already thinking about the possibility of doing a master's or perhaps later a PhD in relation to African presence in China, which is what I ended doing, right? Now, another important aspect of uh, your own personal, my own personal research uh, uh, story is how when you start uh, doing, you know, uh, the early basic research, you have certain ideas and you ask certain questions and you're interested in specific topics, but then somehow through the research process from the very early stages when you start developing your own research proposal all the way forward when you start doing your PhD and, and, and even later when you finish it, the, the whole process is a process of transformation, construction, destruction. Uh, I think it's something that you have to have very clear in your mind that you should never be uh, uh, fixated with a particular idea and think that that's the only way to approach something, right? So um, when I was when I started looking at this topic, I started thinking about you know Africans in China as a novel phenomenon, and I started looking at you know some of the reports and and, and some of the very few articles that were written 
talking about history and, and sort of talking about the history of trading routes, the connections from West Africa to East Africa, the Middle East, uh, Southeast Asia, and how sort of the economic transformations that we've been witnessing over the last three or four decades somehow pushed many of these um, people that were moving from West Africa and East Africa to Asia, which were uh, mostly traders, how they were somehow pushed uh, all the way to uh, to Hong Kong first and later to uh, Guangzhou. So in the late 1990s, obviously a very famous um, building in Hong Kong, Chunking Mansions that you can see down there, uh, was really the hot spot of the uh, international, transnational, global connections between the African continent and uh, Asia, and in particular southern uh, the southern China region. Right. So in um, 2010, I mean, I had done this research. I had thought about this at a very early stage, even a couple of years before I started doing my PhD research. In 2010, I took a short hiatus uh, and um, uh, lived a little bit in Australia for a year and a half. I did an MPhil in uh, uh, in the University of Sydney in the Gender and Cultural Studies Department, where I uh, sort of uh, uh, defined in a way, uh, in a better way, uh, my interest for this particular topic. And in 2011, I applied for a Hong Kong uh, PhD fellowship scheme. Maybe some of you are um, participants or fellows of this scheme. Uh, so that's what brought me to uh, Lingnan uh, University. Uh, where I now have an assistant professor position, right? So, um, you know, then I just spoke to you a little bit about the early ideas and the early knowledge that I developed about um, the particular topic that I that I got interested in and that I thought could be a very successful topic for a PhD. And then I started engaging more directly into, you know, uh, the early ideas that actually became part of uh, the Hong Kong uh, Fellowship uh, Scheme proposal, right? And some of these early theoretical ideas obviously dealt with notions like migration, globalization, uh, ethnic minorities. But after starting the PhD, things started to slightly um, become reshaped or redefined, right? So instead of talking about ethnic minorities, I started talking about diaspora. Instead of talking about globalization, I decided to go a little bit more focused and talk about transnationalism and transnational connections. And instead of talking about migration, there's a, obviously, as you can imagine, there's a huge literature on migration. And, and this literature is mainly uh, determined by Euro-American so I decided to move into a different framework, which also talks about how people move from one place to another, uh, but has has a slightly different political uh, implications, which is implications, sorry, which is the, the notion of mobility, right? So I started sort of becoming, um, going deeper into my research, but also becoming more politicized in terms as in, 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 in relation to what were the terms that I was going to be using to um, to define the case study that I was dealing with. I was profoundly, at that point, I was profoundly influenced by this book, which I totally recommend for everyone doing any PhD in social sciences and in humanities. Uh, Manuel de Landa, A New Philosophy of Society, Assemblage Theory and Social Complexity, especially the part on social complexity, I think is really interesting for, for us that, work, that are working on uh, research projects in humanities and in, and in, uh, and in um, uh, social sciences to go a little bit away from this type of simplifications and reductionisms that plague uh, knowledge production, right? So no important note, at that time, I saw those theories and ideas as different frameworks, different viewpoints to social reality, but I hadn't made any empirical observations yet. And, and I think that the important point that I need to make here is that ethnography uh, is mostly about empirical observation and about reporting or writing about those empirical observations. I hope that throughout this lecture, I will, I will make that very clear, right? That ethnography is about participation in a particular community, in a particular space, but also about the portrayal and the politics of the portrayal of, that, of those observations, right? How do you represent those observations?
So the place where we do these uh, empirical observations is called fieldwork. But when you're doing the type of research that I'm talking about, that I'm describing today, uh, you have to do something that is called pre-field work, right? That means that you have to do some research before you go to the place, before you meet the people that you're going to be meeting, before you get in touch with the communities. And in that stage of pre-field work, you will find many exciting ideas from readings, books, articles. In my particular case, I was finding a lot of very exciting theoretical ideas that were defining what I wanted to look into. And what I thought at that point that I wanted to look into was the growing presence of an African transnational community, the growing presence of African transnational migrants, and the possible emergence of what I used to think of as new cultural configurations in Guangzhou. Mind you, this is before you go and uh, do your own sort of um, first-hand experience work in the field work, right? So at that point, I was thinking that I wanted to frame my research, that the theoretical framework that I was going to be using was going to be a framework of transnational migration. So based on that, what I had done pre-field work was historical research, extensive uh, literature review, was looking at the academic databases, uh, and finding so many things written about transnational migration. I did <clears throat> some early mapping of the areas where I was going to be uh, conducting uh, my ethnographic research. That, that means that I went to the places for one day or two days and sort of surveyed the area uh, uh, and sort of um, established where were, what were the locations where I was going to be focusing. And more importantly, at that stage, I was thinking through theories. I was th thinking through theoretical ideas that other people have uh, been uh, developing. So in in, uh, in particular, I was thinking about transnational migration and something that is called the theory of assemblages, which is related to what I was telling you earlier in relation to social complexity from Manuel de Landes' books. So these were the, um, the, the early mappings that I did. I don't know if I can focus, focus on them. But these are just maps that I, you know, I went to this section of Guangzhou and I, and I was walking around and I decided that this was the area where I was going to be uh, focusing, right? In particular, this one, I identified this neighborhood in uh, Xiaobeilu in Guangzhou, which um, uh, some people used to call um, the Africa, Little Africa or the Chocolate City. Some people used to call it like that. So, but at that point, I had made no real decision on... Uh, um, the theoretical framework. I was a little bit unsure as to make a theoretical decision before going into the field. And uh, and that actually later I realized that uh, it was a good idea that I had uh, done something good for my research when I decided not to uh, commit to a theoretical framework before uh, understanding a little bit of what was happening in the f in in the field, right? Before doing some empirical observations, but although I hadn't decided uh, on uh, on a on a theoretical framework in this case, what I was talking to you about transnational migration, I was clear that my method was going to be ethnography, right? Now, another important note here is that one must be theoretically informed when entering the field. This means when you go and gather data and analyze it. This does not mean that one has to have a perspective on the data at the outset. At least that's how we think in, uh, in certain areas of humanities in particular, but also in social sciences in some areas too, and in particular in cultural studies, right? You do not have to be committed to a theoretical framework. You do not have to have a theoretical perspective prior to your engagement with individuals and communities, but you do have to be indeed theoretically informed, right? to know what are the theories that sort of surround the case that you are studying. And in, in relation to this, 
I obviously developed some early research questions. So some of my early research questions, this is already inside my PhD. Earlier, I was talking to you about other types of questions that I was interested, but right now we're talking about when I was already in the position in which many of you are now. When you're sitting there, you already started your research, you're already enrolled in an MPhil or a PhD, and you have to develop certain early research questions that you think are going to be guiding your uh, your um, your dissertation, right? So at that point, I was thinking about, are there spaces for Africans in Chinese cities? Uh, what are the possibilities and hopes for settlement in China? Is life in China an aspiration for these Africans? One other question that I was thinking about is, how or what are the transnational connections um, uh, these subjects produce? How transnational are these subjects? Well, what do I mean by transnationality? Transnationality is something I was also thinking about. Is there an emergence of transnational identities? So I thought I needed to, to map the structures of transnational families and networks, to map the transnational activities, the transnational movement, the transnational interactions, transnational mobility, and so on. Uh, and I was sure that I could do all of these things through the use of uh, ethnography and in particular through uh, interviews traffic, uh, and, 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 and other forms of observation. So one other question that I uh, had at that time was, uh, what are the organizations, cultural scenes and individuals that structure this case of transnational migration? So you can see that Somehow, uh, although I was not entirely committing, as I told you earlier, to the framework of transnational migration, uh, I, I was highly influenced by uh, transnational migration to ask these questions that were later obviously uh, modified. Um, so you may be wondering at this point, so, but what, you, you didn't have a hypothesis when you started your research? Um, and, and the answer is no. I didn't have a hypo hypo hypothesis. Um, I was theoretically informed and I had developed these theoretically informed questions, but I was not uh, uh, advancing a clearly stated hypothesis, right? Uh, again, this is uh, this goes back to what I was telling you earlier in terms of method and methodology, that uh, sometimes people think that the fact that there's not a clear method in culture, a clear methodology in cultural studies uh, could be a weakness. Some people also think that not having a hypothesis at the beginning is a weakness, but that that's just one particular perspective and there are many different perspectives as to how uh, to do research. So but how to find answers to these questions? And this is where we start talking about the particular method that I'm talking about today. So how do we deal with people's experiences? This is why we use ethnography. Now, there's so many different types of, there's so many different definitions as to what is ethnography and also as to what are people's experiences, right? In a relation to ethnography, we think of experience, that very difficult thing to define, as a category of analysis, as a unit of analysis. We can analyze what is experience, and this is one of the advantages that ethnography has. It focuses on experience and it brings experience to the core, to the fore, to the center, right? So when we talk about ethnography, what is ethnography? This is a very basic um, description, but ethnography means the writing of people, people, ethno, writing, graphy. So ethnography is not necessarily writing about people, although we also write about people, but it's the writing of people, the portrayal of communities and individuals, and so on and so forth. So uh, ethnography does six very important things, and I'm gonna go one by one. Ethnography is a people-based or community-based method for making cultural observations. So what it does for you as a method, it allows you to make cultural observations. Ethnography can be described as a tool for describing culture in a qualitative sense, not quantitative, but qualitative. 
looking at the experiences, the emotions, the feelings, the ideas, the stories that people tell you, right? <clears throat> also, ethnography helps you to capture everyday life of people occupying a particular site and the cultural practices within those sites. So ethnography is very good at uh, allowing researchers to get into the everyday life of people and understanding their cultural practices. Also, ethnography, one of the things that ethnography does for the researcher is help the researcher understanding uh, meaning, the meanings of activities from the participant point of view. And here we have something called the thick description, focusing on the thick description of naturally occurring social practices. This is going a little bit more into the anthropological side of ethnography, but uh, I just want to highlight here that through participant observation, because the, the person that is doing ethnography often is in the same physical place where the individuals and the communities that have that are studied, uh, um, you know, do their activities, right? So we assume that the ethnographer understands certain things uh, from the point of view of the participants, which allow him to uh, him or her to make a, a better description of those social practices. Uh, so also ethnography allows you to have an in-depth contact with a site and the people in it over a period of time. So there's something that we call longitudinal research. So this is being in touch with people throughout several months or several years to see how their stories and their experiences uh, change. And finally, also ethnography is good for building up trust. So you have a deeper understanding, a deeper uh, you can provide a deeper portrayal of a particular case rather than what journalism does, which is normally just a snapshot, a fly in, fly out um, perspective. So, what is ethnography? You may still be wondering. Ethnography, if I have to give a definition, is a research process in which the researcher closely observes records and engages in the daily life of another culture, an experience labeled as the fieldwork method, and then writes accounts of this culture emphasizing descriptive detail. I told you earlier that ethnography is this twofold process in which you first go to a place and you do empirical observations, but then as, as with the same amount of importance, you have to write an account, right? And these are two processes like the two sides of the coin of ethnography, which are really uh, very important. And despite the fact that you may not do, be doing ethnography in your research, uh, the, the, writing, uh, the writing of an account is also obviously what you're doing in your PhD and is also very a very important part of any research processes. Now, there's a number of ethnographic techniques or methods or ways to approach uh, ex the experiences of people. And I'm just going to go quickly through them. We talk about observation and participant observation, interviews, conversations, but also uh, referring to key cultural consultants, what some people call stakeholders, although I don't really like that word. And there are certain methods to contact these stakeholders or these key cultural, cultural consultants through sampling, snowballing. These are more specific ways in which you do um, uh Ethnography. Ethnography. So these are some images from my field work. So finally, we get to talk a little bit about perhaps the most important stage uh, when we talk about ethnography, right? Ethnography sort of thrives and becomes a method uh, beyond the descriptions uh, through field work, right? So these are images from the very early days I spent um, in Guangzhou a long, long time ago. Um, some of them are mine, some of them are not mine. Um, I, obviously, I was looking at communities, at, 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 at families, uh, Afro-Chinese or Sino-African families. A lot of youngsters coming from different parts of the African continent come to a study in China or come to uh, do some trade in China. As you can see, the, this is one of the neighborhoods where there's a strong, there used to be a strong African presence. The, and the neighborhood is called San, San Yuan 
San Yuan Li in Beijing, in Guangzhou, sorry. This is one image that I took from, um, from a church. Uh, religion is a very important point of connection between Africans and Chinese um, in Guangzhou. And here you can see an image of uh, Uju Kuema, who is the man at the center, who is the the community leader, one of the most important stakeholders. So one of the reasons why I'm showing you these images is because earlier I was discussing, you know, what are the, the, the sort of the areas that you need to focus on, individuals, communities, uh, practices, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, this man here is the president of the Nigerian community in Guangzhou. He also calls himself the president of Africa in Guangzhou. Uh, and well, obviously, I was living in a neighborhood in Guangzhou where you can sort of uh, interact with um, the everyday life of the people that you are trying to study and represent. This is a place called uh, Xiaobei Lu. And Xiaobei Lu is a very famous place in Guangzhou because um, it is near Guangzhou, the old Guangzhou train station, but also is a place where a lot of foreigners and a lot of internal domestic um um, migrants uh, from different provinces of China all converge together in a very small neighborhood and you find very interesting mixes that you can see here in these images is an African restaurant or so a Turkish restaurant and um, this is a neighborhood where I did my ethnography this means that here is where I mostly stayed for a number of months I interviewed people here I spoke to community leaders here I spoke to both Chinese and uh, African uh, business owners, uh, interviewed them many times, and so on and so forth, right? So in case of, uh, in the case of Africans in that particular part of Guangzhou, there's a lot of misleading information. And one of the very, um, one of the things that really led me to do this research was that I always thought that uh, there was a lot of misleading information about the case study. So no one really knew, and still up to today, nobody really knows how many Africans are there in Guangzhou. Some people spoke, uh, uh, if you do a little bit of research or if you do a little bit of um, Googling or Weiboying, uh, sorry, by doing, you would see that there are all these numbers talking about 300,000 Africans in Guangzhou and so on and so forth. There were different forms of understanding this African presence. Uh, some Chinese researchers would talk about African enclaves, like isolated spaces where Africans wouldn't interact with with um, Chinese communities. And also the other take on this particular case back in the day, I'm talking about 2011 or 2012, was this idea of um, the African communities. Um, so the, the place where, as I just told you, the place where I did this research was an urban village uh, in Guangzhou called uh, Xiaobei or Denfeng, which is kind of was for many years the epicenter of uh, Africa-China uh, connections and, at the, and the center of my um, ethnography and research focus. So one of the important things that I got after my field work was that I was now equipped to challenge existing knowledge and existing representations, not only scholarly uh, representations, but also media representations of the particular case study that I was working on. So through my field work, I was able to challenge existing theorizations about Africans in Guangzhou. For instance, as I just told you a minute ago, there was these two notions mainly. So what I mean here is that the literature, the articles, the books that I found were talking about these two notions, right? These two ways of understanding African presence in Guangzhou. The one that was proposed by the Chinese researchers was this notion of the enclave. And the other one proposed by an African Ghanaian and researcher was this notion of the community. And both of them assumed that these Africans in Guangzhou were immigrants, right? So through my field work, through talking to people, through doing interviews, to, through generating my own data, uh, through this method of ethnography, I was able to sort of create new theoretical ideas that emerge out of the field work, right? I was looking at 
uh, notions like mobility. I was looking at aspirations. I was looking at performativity. So in many ways, I went away from the very early questions. I don't know if you remember by now. I've been talking for about an hour, maybe. But in the in the beginning, you saw all these questions that I had about transnationalism and transnational connections and trade and so on and so forth. So I managed to go away from those early questions. And I think it, it is expected that you will move away from your early um assumptions and questions, but I was also able to go beyond existing theorizations such as the enclave and the community by looking at different uh, aspects of this um, uh, of this case study and especially looking at this case study from different uh, perspectives. And in that way, ethnography, as I say here, as an open-ended process often leads you to unexpected paths. So one day I was in Guangzhou attending a dinner with some of the community people that I was working with and somebody introduced a musician, a Nigerian musician to me. And this Nigerian musician uh, assumed that I was like a media person and he invited me to his concerts, his music concerts. And then I attended many of his music concerts and I met a lot of his other musician friends and I got totally inside the African, especially Nigerian musician community in Guangzhou. So I started researching that and that's why I started writing about aspirations, performativity and sort of my field, my field work changed. Uh, not only the assumptions and questions that I had, but in, in specifically the whole direction of my research which is in many ways uh, really uh, good. So also when we're talking about field work, uh, we need to consider that new theoretical ideas emerging from my underground conversations led me to develop new research questions, as I was just saying a minute ago, empirically grounded questions, the ones that I was really looking for because the only questions that I had prior to my field work were questions that were emerging to me out of my dialogue with the articles and the books and the literature that I was reading. This is an intellectual internal dialogue that I was having. Now that I had been there on the ground, interviewing people, meeting people, having this kind of empirical observation, participant observation through ethnography, I was able to generate the questions that I was looking for. I was actually, and I realized that I was looking for these questions, right? Questions about citizenship, belonging, grassroots forms of organization, representation, knowledge production, etc. So these were indeed innovative questions that had not been asked before and that I tried to answer in the writing process. So no one that had been doing research about Africans in China at that point had been was asking the questions that I managed to ask at that point and this is one of the beauties of not really having a research process that uh, has a, a, a preset of ideas that you're gonna go uh, to the field work to try to prove I'm talking about a hypothesis in that sense right um, so um, yeah so when I talk about the writing process remember I keep telling you or oh, I was telling you earlier today um, that ethnography is divided between the field work, your immersion in the community, your contact with people, and the other very important part of community, uh, sorry, of ethnography is right, the writing process, right? So which is a whole other process as complex as field work and that I'm not going to be discussing much uh, today here, but I just want you to keep that in mind because not only when you use uh, a method such as ethnography, but in general, when you're doing a PhD dissertation, uh, the writing process is in itself a very complex process that deals with many issues and politics in terms of representation and knowledge production. But I want to share with you this very uh, influential uh, model, uh, at least influential to me, a research model that sort of um, encapsulates many of the things that I've been talking about today, right? This is a model of research designed by uh, Finnish scholar Perti Alasutari, and um, he pretty much says that research is like an like an hourglass uh, uh, clock, right? Uh, in the sense that one starts out with a rather broad theoretical and structural framework that places a particular research site in a large context. And that also 
validates the choice of that particular case study, right? So this is the very broad perspective. After that, in the second stage of this hourglass model of research, the actual field work can be located in the epicenter of the hourglass. This is where one analyzes in detail a very specific, closely defined object of a study as a world of its own, right? That's the, the space of ethnography, the space of the field work. When you are living in that very, immersed in that very intense reality, right, of the everyday life uh, of the communities and the individuals that you're dealing with in ethnography. And then after you remove yourself from that reality, the final phase of the study is that where one assesses and discusses the results of the case study within a broader framework, probably somewhat changed and developed during the study, uh, is what forms the bottom of the hourglass. And at the bottom of the hourglass, is where, in my particular case, there was a discussion of the cultural logic that made possible certain structural changes. In my case, African presence in China. But you can apply this to any of the cases in your uh, particular um, research. So context at the bottom of the, uh, of the hourglass is also about contextualizing the case study within a larger historical and cultural framework, not formulating a universal general theory, but rather shedding light on the historical moment through the case study. The theoretical framework was formulated as a final outcome of critical reflection on the case studies uh, results instead of being a theory proven correct by them. Right. So in my particular case, through ethnography and from um, from a perspective like the ones we use in humanity, in some areas of humanities like cultural studies, my theoretical framework was not there at the beginning, was formulated as a consequence of critical reflection and field work. Right. Uh, so had I decided to impose a theoretical framework at the beginning or impose a hypothesis at the beginning, I would have to struggle with the very problematic uh, notion of having to go to the field work to prove that my ideas are right. And that's not the case uh, for this particular method of ethnography, right? You don't go to the field work to prove that your ideas are right by looking for certain answers from the people that you're asking questions to. Rather, you go and you have conversations and you learn from people and then you sort of like give an explanation or a theory uh, um, or a theoretical framework to try to understand a particular phenomenon. So finally, I've come to the last point of this um, uh, online lecture in which I'm going to give you this suggestion. Always be ready for changing directions. I think that one of the most important things that you need to do through your PhD is be ready to change, be ready to challenge your own assumptions, be ready to challenge your own questions, be ready to betray yourself if you want and take another direction, right? Uh, without thinking that people are going to be judging you. The ideas that you came in with and the final product of your research are likely to be different. Hopefully they're going to be different. Otherwise, why would you put yourself through three or four years of suffering? <laughs> uh, it's not necessarily bad if you feel lost and confused at some points throughout your research, your MPhil or your PhD. <clears throat> but do talk to your supervisor about your feelings. Do talk to your friends and your peers about your feelings. But because um, your emotional health, your mental health is perhaps the most important thing. It's not perhaps. It is the most important thing, not only in your life, uh, but also uh, throughout the, the, the process of the next couple of years where you're going to be putting your mind to very strenuous um, intellectual exercises. So if you feel anxious over a long period of time, or if you think that research is negatively affecting other areas of your life, uh, I really recommend, this is just a personal suggestion, that you talk to people around you. Doing a research degree is a hard but rewarding experience, and you're not alone, right? So always seek for help if you need it. So thank you very much. Again, I am Roberto Castillo, an assistant professor in cultural studies at uh, Lingnan, and I'm very happy to have uh, spoken to you about ethnography and how to do ethnographic analysis. I really hope that some of the ideas that I discussed here uh, are of help to you during the years in which you're going to be doing research with us here at Lingnan, and I hope to meet you at some point in, in the physical, in the real world. Thank you very much.